past several months, we've been in the middle of a disruption as a country, what I've called an intermission. The effects of COVID-19 have been felt all over the world. And so this month, our theme has been to discern God's calling for us during this disturbance to our lives. It's our mission in the intermission. And we've read how Jesus called his disciples and how he's calling you because Jesus believes in you. And, and we've learned in times of difficulty the story of Esther and how it reminds us that we can find strength in community. But then the events of last week unfolded. And now we are yet again finding ourselves in the middle of a disruption as a country. Another tragedy, another death. Yet another opportunity as the church to respond with hope and new life. There's a story in the Bible, it's found in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. And it's a story about these five daughters who after their, their father dies, they were fighting for, they were standing up for their, their claim and their right to their inheritance. But they had all these things going against them. First, they were women who were, happened to be living in a time and a culture where women were given very few rights. They were living in a man's world and it was, it was the son's right to uh, carry on the legacy. It was the son's claim to carry on the family name who usually carried on the inheritance. And, and there had also been this rebellion out in the wilderness and, and people were grumbling against Moses and they were, they were rising up against Moses and about 250 of them co-conspired to cause a rebellion. It was short-lived, it didn't last too long, but all of those who were involved in the rebellion died. And their children and their grandchildren and, and their relatives, all of those who were left, lost all the rights to their land. And their inheritance was stripped from them. And so here come these, these five women, and their father has died. And some are saying they have no claim to the inheritance because he died as part of that rebellion. And others are saying that he had no rights to the inheritance because of their gender. And these five ladies find their voice, and they begin speaking out and standing up for and wanting to be heard. And here's what happens. Numbers chapter 27. Then the daughters of Zelophehad came forward. Zelophehad was the son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, son of Joseph, and a member of the Massonite clans. And the names of his daughters were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and Eleazar the priest and the leaders and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And they said, our father died in the wilderness, but he was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah. But he died from his own sin, and he had no son. So why would, should the name of our father be taken away from his clan because he had no son? Give to us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophe had a right in what they're saying. And you shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their fathers or their father on to them. And you shall say to the Israelites, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall pass his inheritance on to his daughter. And it shall be for the Israelites a statute and an ordinance the Lord commanded Moses. I think these five women were trailblazers in a way. Because here they are, they're, they're feeling left out, they're feeling forgotten about, they're feeling overlooked, and they longed for change to be made, and they worked for it, and they worked to make it happen. They spoke out. They stood up for themselves and they pushed those in power to reconsider how things have always been. And they were longing for change to come and they believed that they had the power to help make and bring about that change. You know, we live in a world today that is still longing for change. 
We live in a world today that still sees people standing up for and fighting for and wanting their voice at the table. People who feel forgotten about, who feel left out, longing for their pain to be recognized, longing for injustice to be made right, longing to be given worth in a world that so often tries to make us all feel worthless. And I was reading that story this week and, and I wanted to speak on the events that have unfolded in our country over the last couple of weeks now. Because if you haven't seen the video of the death of George Floyd, it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch about Breonna Taylor. And it has once again stirred uh, voices in this country calling for and pleading for things to change. And some of those voices have been peaceful and others have turned to violence, but the voices are there and they're calling for and they're standing up for and they're fighting for some kind of change to happen within racial divides, within gender divides and all of the things that divide us as a people and as a country. And I've been thinking about all of that, about how to respond, how we can respond. And first, I want to say, first we have to recognize and say it out loud and claim it, that hate separates us from we have to be willing to confess that hating someone strictly because of a, a, they're different, a different race, a different gender, a different sex is not of God. It's not what Jesus taught. And as followers of Jesus, we have to be willing to say this is not right. We follow a God who sent his son to reconcile us to him. We serve a reconciling savior, a reconciling God. And part of the mission we are called to be about is that of reconciliation. And part of reconciling means that we have to make room for honest conversations about change. Not only in the church but also in the world that we are called to serve. And violence is not the answer. I think the church is the answer. But we have the answer. Jesus gave us the blueprint for this a long time ago. Jesus came and he, he rounded up some Jewish fishermen and, and they set out, he set out with them. And, and at times they came across different people, people different from themselves, who worshiped different, who looked different, who had different understandings about life. And Jesus sought to find the commonality between them all. He sought to understand and to teach the disciples to understand before seeking to first be understood. And he always spoke with hope and unity. And when Jesus went to the cross, it was all about love and reconciliation. And if you read the book of Acts, you know that this is what the disciples came to learn and understand. The story of Peter finding his way into the home of a, of a Roman soldier. It was the same soldiers that had been asked to hang Jesus. And Peter now is in the home of, of one of them getting ready to baptize. Philip finding his way down a road and he comes across someone from Ethiopia night and day different from himself. And they end up reading scriptures together and talking about how they see it differently and understand it differently. And before Philip leaves, finds himself getting ready to do a baptism. Paul, who we all know was dead set against those who disagreed with him, 
who he saw as different, finds himself at the table with those who are different than himself. And he breaks the bread and he blesses the cup and he says, you belong at this table too. It's because the disciples all came to understand not only what Jesus tried to teach them during his ministry, but also what they saw acted out on the cross. That if God, as seen in the love of Jesus, accepts us and loves us, forgives us, then when that love flourishes in us, we will find ourselves looking beyond what other people look like, where they come from, where they live, and we will embrace them as we have been embraced by Jesus. I think the church has always had the answer. Jesus gave us the blueprint a long time ago. So here's part of our mission. First, we have to name it, church. What happened in these last few days, what has happened in these last few weeks, what has happened in these last few years, we have to call it what it is. Racism, sexism, all the isms that we can think of, anything that tries to create this idea that says you are lesser than, it's wrong. It's sin. And we have to be willing to say that. To own it. And we have to be willing, willing to let God remove any hatred that may be in our heart towards others. We cannot serve a God of reconciliation when we ourselves refuse to reconcile. Peter knew that. Philip knew that. Paul knew that. And we know that too. And just like Jesus taught us, we have to be willing to find the commonality between one another. I mean, oftentimes there are more things we have in common than we realize. And we have to be willing to recognize our own biases and realize that we have them and talk about them with one another. We have to be willing to first seek to understand before we seek to be understood. So much of our communication gets lost because we start talking over one another or trying to be heard or trying to get the other to understand our point of view. But for real reconciliation to take place, we have to be willing to put our feelings and our understanding on hold long enough to hear what the other has to say. We have to listen to understand. And then, and only then, after they have shared with us, do we share with them. And in our sharing, we have to be willing to speak with hope and unity. These are the things that will help bring about change. And there's been so much chaos the last couple. So much anger spilling over, so much lashing out at one another. And the question is, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? You know, I keep hearing reports in the news about reopening the church. And the truth is the church never closed. We shut the doors to the building for a while, but the church has never been the building. The church has always been the people. And the church is the people wherever we are. And the church has never been closed. It continues in you. Continues in you every time you make an effort to speak with someone who is different than yourself. It continues in you every time you make the effort to understand someone who is different than you. Continues in you every time you make an effort to speak on the, in the name 
of the God of love. The church never closed. And the world is still in need of its church. Of you. To stand up and to speak out and to do as her mission statement says. Be bold witnesses to the love of God to all people. Jesus shows us the way. He came to reconcile and to heal and to transform. Paul puts it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. Paul says that all of this is from God who reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and he has committed us to be messengers of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. It's a tale as old as time, as old as five sisters from the Old Testament making their stand, speaking up for their rights, people longing for change. And in a world that still needs changing. Be a change maker. For the Lord has shown us what is good to love mercy, to seek justice, and to walk humbly with our God. And it's part of our mission when we choose to accept it. And my prayer my prayer is that we do. Because the world right now is standing in the need of prayer. And I believe. I believe. The church is still the answer. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for making one human family of all the peoples of the earth and for creating all the wonderful diversity of cultures. And God, we would pray that you would forgive those of us who have been silent or apathetic in the face of intolerance and bigotry. And Lord, take away the arrogance and hatred which affects our hearts and the hearts of this country. Lord, break down the walls which separate us and help us to find that unity and help us to find that unity will enable us to become your beloved community. Empower us, Lord, to speak boldly for justice and truth. To help us deal with one another without hatred or bitterness, working together with mutual love and respect. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands, great is your
thank you again for joining us today. I hope you have found today's service meaningful and that you leave today just a little bit more refreshed to start a new week. If you have found this service meaningful today, I, I want to invite you to share that with others. Put it on your Facebook page, on your social media, so that others may be touched by our service as well. And if you haven't done so already, find the link to the chat in the chat box and fill out the connection card because it is important for you to feel connected to community now more than ever. And we want to be there for you as your church to give you the resources that you need to help you grow in your faith and to serve others. And now as we go out into the week, I want you to remember to look beyond yourselves and find someone who you don't know who may be different than you and, and listen to understand. As we continue to encourage one another and to lift one another up, as we seek to serve through this time into our community, as we seek to grow, grow in community and connection with one another. Go in peace. God bless.